Good evening. <coughs> Welcome to our broadcast again. Uh, we did take a little time out from our The Old Testament is About You, and we had discussed some aspects of Holy Week. And uh, I, I want to do that this evening, but I'd also like to answer a few of the questions that people have sent, uh, because I was going to continue talking about faith or superstition. But tonight I want to speak a little bit about how Holy Week is, is laid out before us. We Remember we started Holy Week with the Bridegroom services. Because Christ is the Bridegroom of the Church, and because when we enter into the Church we become a part of the Body of Christ, a part of the Bride of Christ. And this is why when Apostle Paul says that marriage is a type and likeness of Christ in the Church, and that a couple who are married become as one flesh, He's also, at that point, talking not only about marriage, but about what marriage reveals as a kind of prophecy or revelation. And, of course, the church becomes one together with our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, so we celebrate the bridegroom services and read those particular prophecies. And we discussed last year the bridegroom services, and uh, I think you'll find that video still online here, uh, called Holy Week of 2008. And I'd suggest listening to it again. But after the bridegroom services, on the middle day of the week, that is on Wednesday, in the evening, we serve the great healing service. And now I realize that I think Russians don't always because they have the uh, notion that it can only be served in the cathedral or some something like that. But generally, the great healing service is the matin service on Wednesday evening. And it's quite significant to us, because remember that the word for Savior, sotir in Greek, really means a healer. Uh, salvation means to heal. And, of course, even the Latin word which we borrow, salvation, has as its root word, salve or ointment, as, as a healing salve or ointment. And so the healing service is quite significant in telling us what the ministry of Jesus Christ is really all about, what the cross is about, what uh, the, the sacrifice of Christ is really all about. It's about the healing of the fallen human nature, delivering us from bondage to Satan, because, of course, we're, we have to be redeemed from one who holds us in bondage. And we're redeemed from the one who, as Apostle Paul says, that man was all his lifetime held in bondage through the fear of death by him who had the power of death, that is, Satan. And what does it mean that he has the power of death? Satan cannot take anyone's life himself. But sin is really the power of death. That is, falling short of the mark, missing the mark, the habitual misuse of our energies, which is what sin really means. And it keeps one separated from God and therefore separated from life. And our Lord Jesus Christ is going to heal this alienation, this separation, to heal the fallen human nature and make it possible for those who will to enter into the redeemed human nature, which is the church. This is one reason why we must recognize that there is a clearly identifiable church which Jesus Christ founded. And it has boundaries, and it has uh, a kind of discipline within it. The body of Christ is an identifiable, visible church in which the truth is maintained. That's not to say that all of the members live that truth, or that they behave as if they believed it all, some of, some of our Orthodox people, but that the truth abides there within the church. And it's there for all to partake of. And within it, we find that the church itself is a spiritual hospital in which people are being healed. And they're being healed really of the, the fallen human nature and little by little brought into the, the, the true human nature, which is the church itself, the body of Christ. and. Uh, within that church, that body of Christ, which is united to its head, to Jesus Christ himself, 
we find this whole process of healing that goes on throughout our lifetime and goes on continuously in the divine services and particularly in the liturgy where we receive the medicine of immortality that is the body and blood of Jesus Christ in Holy Communion. And so to make it plain what the ministry of Christ ultimately is and what the events of Holy Week actually teach us, that great Holy Week over 2,000 years ago, when our Lord Jesus Christ suffered so greatly for our sake. The healing service belongs in the middle of that week, on that Wednesday, because it teaches us so profoundly what it is we're commemorating, what it is we're celebrating, what it is we're actually participating in, and really what the Church truly is. First, the Bridegroom of Christ. Secondly, a spiritual hospital. And how are we ultimately and finally healed? By the resurrection of Jesus Christ and his ascension into heaven. Of course, the crucifixion is a part of that whole process. So Thursday night, which is this evening, we read the 12 Passion Gospels. Having participated in the healing service, however, we can understand First of all, the great high priestly prayer of Christ and the rest of the Passion Gospels in a new light, in the light of the process of he the healing of mankind, of the healing of hum the human nature. And at the Lamentations of the Tomb, when we gather with a certain grief and sorrow and repentance that Christ had to suffer so greatly for our sake in order to reveal to us the depth and the power of his co-suffering love for mankind and to pull us away from the power of Satan. The power of Satan is not only in leading us into a separation from God that results in death or has resulted in the entry of death into humanity, but the power of Satan is also in delusion and deceit, to deceive us, to offer us a counterfeit of what God has given us. And we are really very gullible in that area. And we fall into delusion, and Satan entraps us through that delusion and deceit. Uh, he simply plays on our own passions, on the things we've given ourselves over to in this life. Well, standing before the epitaphium, the um, icon of the preparation, uh, uh, the preparation for burial, really that's what the icon is. It's not the shroud of Christ. Uh, it's properly called in, English, in, in Greek before the tomb. And this is the lamentation, the icon of the lamentation before the tomb. It's the proper name for the icon, the icon of the lamentation. And when we stand there calling ourselves to repentance, make our prostration, and some people will be prostrate during the entire lamentation service. To make it a kind of repentance, understanding that repentance is really this struggle to change the direction of our lives, to change our perspective, to change the way we see things, to change our point of view, to change, to turn our life around and take it in another direction, which is really what metanoia or metanya means. And the healing service has given us an insight into what repentance actually means. Because repentance is to make use of the healing energy that Jesus Christ has poured into humanity, has poured in through his church. So the lamentations are there to, as, as a part of the healing process for us. That repentance is a part of that healing process, the greatest part of the healing process. And at the lamentations of the tomb, this is when we can really bring ourselves, seeing our Savior lying before the tomb, being prepared for burial, move our hearts toward true repentance and toward true healing.